he kind of basically had the idea for us. Because what was he, what was happening there, Jason? He came to us desperate. He was like, you know, I'm gonna tell you how it what it is, you know, like this is what's happening. And we already probably he was the one who signed a check of this, you know, like big payments to like celebrity athletes. Like, what am I gonna do? And the answer was, well, just tell the world that. <laughs> tell the world. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the world that you pay them a lot of money, you know, for them to promote Hulu. Hello, and welcome to the Bagley Talks with an Important Person show, where the world's top advertising professionals break down their creative process and reveal the secrets and techniques to doing the best work of your life. I'm your host, Jason Bagley, Olivia Rodrigo fan, former ECD of Widen Kennedy, Portland, and founder of the Audacious School of Astonishing Pursuits where I teach creatives in eight weeks what it took me 16 years at Wyden and Kennedy to learn. If you're watching this on YouTube, hi, this is what my face looks like. Let me know what you think in the comments. But if you're listening to the podcast and want to see an anatomical model wearing a Boba Fett helmet or the super detailed presentation decks we share, there's a link to the YouTube channel in the podcast description. I highly recommend it. But without further ado, let's get to today's guest. This week's guest is Guto Araki. Guto grew up in Sao Paulo and made his way to Shiat LA where he did award-winning work for Gatorade. He then became an ECD at Deutsch LA where among other things he created the super smart and funny Snapple campaign and created crazy stunts like Taco Moon for Taco Bell and epic work for Tile. He then became chief creative officer at Big Family Table where he won the Hulu account and created the now famous and prolific Hulu Has Live Sports campaign which we will talk about today. And he recently took the creative helm at r and Partners in Vegas, where he's doing great work for brands like Las Vegas Tourism and the Las Vegas Raiders. Guto is talented. Guto is handsome. Guto is Brazilian. Guto is a certified sea captain. And I'm lucky to say that Guto is one of my best friends. Give it up for Guto Araki. It's Jason Bagley's advertising podcast. He interviews important people, it's true. But that doesn't mean that you're not important, cause he didn't choose to interview you. Maybe he was just planning to contact you to interview you on another day. Or maybe he doesn't have your email address. Every creature on the planet is important in their own special way. Cows, sharks, and gazelles deserve to be interviewed. Birds and whales each have a valid point of view. I mean, they're probably not as interesting to talk to as you. But you're less interesting than the person on this show. It's true. I'm not sure what my point is. All right, Guto. Great to have you on the show. Uh, you know, I don't know if you knew this before this moment, but you are a very important person because you're on the Bagley Talks to an important person. And real quick, I want to talk about, uh, I had the opportunity to be the chief creative officer of Deutsch LA for about seven months, maybe the shortest CCO stint of all time. And it wasn't because there was anything wrong with Deutsch. I was actually having a great time, great people, but I got the opportunity to go back and lead Wyden Kennedy Portland. I couldn't turn that down. But when I got there, uh, we met, I think the very first day I was there, I, I got there, I gave like a speech and said hello and everybody welcomed me. It was great. And then we met at some point during the day and I think it took us approximately uh, 15 to 18 seconds to hit it off and become friends. And we've been, we've been great friends ever since then. Is that accurate? Do I have that story correct? How, how many minutes you said it again? I've uh, 16 seconds. Oh uh, yeah. Around that. I was going to say 18, anywhere in from 18 to 20, but yeah, it's pretty accurate. You'll go with 16. And, uh, I think that the reason why we connected so rapidly it's because you were incredibly honest from moment zero of our conversation thank god i wasn't responsible for a certain account in that agency 
but I used to be responsible for, uh, for that account. And you came to me and you asked me, why are the commercials so bad? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember that part. <laughs> and, and, and so that was actually, so w when that happened, you actually thought, oh, this guy's going to say, say it like it is, or what happened? Like, how did, why did you respond to that? Well, it's, you know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, intervention, an intervention, intervention for people who are like chemically dependent, right? Like if, uh, if you have one of those in, in the family, which happens and it's a disease, the only way for that person to, to get better is acknowledging that they have that problem. And what happens in agencies and mainly with new CCOs is that they don't want to burn the house down the second they walk in, uh, which is exactly what you did. Uh, <laughs> and I appreciated that uh, immediately. I, I, I was like, well, you know, this man came to this huge agency and uh, he's not holding it back. And you weren't even like, you weren't like aggressive. You were, you meant it. You, you were really just very honest. And then, and it's a problem that agencies have. I, I think that every agency has, um, you know, hold, they, they host these town halls, right? Like when they talk about the work that they do. And it's, uh, it's very painful for a lot of people because the town halls, in, in theory, it's to raise the morale of the agency and show everybody in the agency that they're valuable, that they're participating in something significant. So there is this false... Um, celebration of work as if it's, it's spectacular uh, and, and everybody feels good. But for creatives, it's very confusing because if you're a junior creative, you're like, uh, okay, this, so this is good work. And you know, like you are, you, you are absorbing a, the wrong reference. And if you are, uh, you're, and if you're a talented, creative you're looking at a town hall and everyone's clapping for terrible work and then you are you are deflated right away because you're like well this agency has no idea what's good work <laughs> am i on the wrong place yeah that is it it is tough i've found that to be tough as a as a creative leader to know how to handle work that i really don't think is very good when you're supposed to get up in front of the agency and, and it's challenging because you also know that a lot of people are working really hard and they deserve uh they deserve some acknowledgement for the fact that they're working hard and they are bringing in money to the agency which is helping to pay everybody's salaries and there's a you know there's it's not it's not that there's nothing valuable happening but i have always felt if, uh this painful uh disconnect with my creative integrity when i and for the exactly the same the reason you're saying it's confusing it kind of also makes it so like if i get up there and say wow great job this is great work everybody about terrible work it devalues when i get up there and say it about legitimately great work We'll get back to Jason and Guto in a moment, but if you want to listen to this full episode and all other full episodes of Bagley Talks to an Important Person, check out Creative Mega Machine. Jason's exclusive eight-week creative coaching and mentorship program where Jason throws six metric tons of highly illegal, non-EPA-approved rocket fuel on your career. Creative Mega Machine is a time machine for your career, teaching you exactly how to get the best work of your life about a decade earlier than you would otherwise. Through on-demand lessons and live Q&As with Jason, he will personally answer all your questions as he reveals all the secrets and techniques that he and his teams use to create iconic campaigns for Nike, Old Spice, KFC, Meow Wolf, and more. You will learn in eight weeks what took him 16 years at Wyden and Kennedy to learn. There is absolutely nothing out there that will accelerate your creativity and earning potential faster than this five-star rated program. Classes are capped at 20 students, so grab your spot before they're gone. Check out the show notes below to learn more about Creative Mega Machine. Let's get back to the podcast. 
I, it occurs to me that I have not said your last name very often, but I'm pretty sure that I'm going to pronounce it correctly, unlike many people. Araki. I am uh, shocked with the perfect Japanese pronunciation. I can even tell which region from Japan you were by that pronunciation. <laughs> I, I don't believe you. Uh, it's a uh, waste of a last name, right? Because like, I think that it's a cool last name, but because there are not that many gutos in advertising, people don't feel like they need to use my last name. Yeah, um, yeah. There's only you know I, I, I only know one guto in my life, so. Yeah, I feel like I'm a bodybuilder with baggy clothes when it comes to my last name because no one ever sees it or or pronounce it. So thanks for for uh, um, talking about my my it's, very it's, Japanese last name. It's a cool last name, and the correct correct pronunciation is Araki for everyone out there. You've already spoken, given two examples of how you admire and value honesty, which leads perfectly into what we wanted to talk about today, uh, Guto, which is the power of honesty and transparency. And, and this is something that you brought up when we spoke uh, before the podcast about something you want to talk about and something that you lean into in your work. So please tell us why you think, <laughs> why you think honesty and transparency is important in life in general, but also specifically as applied to creativity. Yeah, like for sure. Well, first, I didn't say that before, but it, it's awesome to be in your podcast. And this is me being uh, being very honest to you. I think that what you're doing, not only the podcast, but the school and, and everything you're doing is is magnificent and much needed in in an industry that a lot of people think that they should do this, that they should protect their knowledge. So uh, what you're doing on, you know, creating like interesting content using, you know, like your friends, which I know you have many. That's why I'm so flattered to be to be chosen to be here today. I, I think it, I think it's spectacular. So I think that, you know, the honesty, honesty and transparency as you already pointed out, is is essential in in life, at least in civilized life. <laughs> and uh, and and you know, we when we think about ads, I think that the challenge, even though no one points it out and tells you this is the challenge, but the challenge is always how does a brand connect with people? Like that's what it is, right? That's why when you have bad clients. They say like, oh, we want to talk to teenagers. So let's put a bunch of teenagers on a commercial, you know, or we want to talk to in a specific tribe. So let's, you know, choose the wardrobe in a certain way. They think somehow that the way to establish a connection is to hold a mirror to the audience. Right. Yeah. And then when you when you when you think about your life, well, you have you can have a very strong connection with your neighbor who's 89 years old that doesn't know what TikTok is, that doesn't buy, you know, off-white sneakers, like that doesn't know anything about the things that you like, but you have this strong connection with that person. And, and, that, and why? Well, because there is some level of transparency in that, in, in that relationship because it's your neighbor. They see you every day. And, and I think that the neighbor example is an interesting one because the reason why you are yourself to your neighbor is because it's really hard for you to be to pretend to be someone considering that you see your neighbor every day, day in, day out. Right. So like for some reason, we your neighbor without even thinking you're just yourself. You know, you walk out the door in ridiculous pajamas. You know, like they know exactly what time you come back home. You know, they know that your kids are brats. Like they know everything about you. And that's why for some reason you establish a connection with your neighbor, regardless if your neighbor are, you know, like like-minded or the, if they're your age or anything else. So I think that like talking about connection, you know, like making how the bridge to honesty and transparency, like, you quickly you get to this conclusion 
that in order to establish a strong connection, it, it requires one thing is for you to be honest. Um, and, you know, like, I think that, you know, we always say, like, we don't choose family. We get to choose our friends, but we don't get to choose your family. But even your, if your family has a lot of problems, there is a certain connection. Obviously, I'm not even talking about, like, blood connection, DNA or anything. But there is a certain connection that is much deeper with family. And exactly because with your family, you don't have to pretend to be someone that you're not. Right. Mm -hmm. So when how do you bring that into advertising? Well, you know, like when people think about, uh, you know, a brand, a product service, you know, there is that thing that the brand says and there is that thing that everyone thinks about that brand. And, and if and sometimes it's really hard to talk about that thing because it's either like unhealthy or it's a thing that destroys the planet, you know, or is overpriced or it's, you know, like there's questionable practices behind. So obviously, you know, you can address those things into branding and advertising, but there's always something that you can say as a brand that you know that that's how everyone else sees you. And, 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 and if you are able to find that, uh, even if it's not about the brand, but it's about a specific campaign, I think that you're able to connect with the audience in a much deeper level. And, and it's the funny part is that you never find that on a brief because the <laughs> client, you know, like it, you never find like the client will never say like, hey, you know, here's the truth about our product. No like they will probably say something else and you have to, to dig deeper in order to find that. And sometimes you have to dig deeper on people. You have to forget the brand a little bit and, yeah. and, and about, you know, and, and just look at a brief as if you didn't even work in advertising. Like if I was a person, you know, like what is, how do I see this brand or what this brand is trying to say to me? There's also like, you're talking about connection. And I want to get into that more, but in addition to connection, that that being honest and transparent can create that connection to a brand in addition to that it will almost immediately make you stand out from all the other marketing that's happening because it is so rare it is incredibly rare for a brand to be truly honest vulnerable transparent that the minute you go there you already are standing out amongst almost everything out there because brands tend to only talk about the less authentic part of the, just only the good parts and only the part that they want to talk about, not even necessarily what the consumer cares about or what is going to resonate with the consumer, but what they want the consumer to think, which you can't make a consumer think something. You can only resonate and try to you know, you can, you can express the features and product, you know, benefits of your brand and hope that it resonates with them, but you can't force them to think a different way for the most part. But anyway, in addition to this connection, I just wanted to point out like it in my, in my program, I talk a lot about like, and I tell creatives always go to honesty, like at least explore what's the most honest thing you could say that you probably think you shouldn't even say, or you won't even be allowed to say, just say it and see what happens. Like, see if that leads to interesting creative ideas because it will immediately make you stand out. Really interesting what you're saying about, you know, like, would people even care about what the brand wants to say? Because I think that like in our industry, and, and I don't know, again, like I know that your audience is very diverse and global at this point. So, you know, maybe in China and Japan where your audience is, is huge, they might use a different acronym, but here in the States, we use the acronym RTB, right? Like the, the reason to believe that, uh, it, that, you know, it's always that the nightmare of the creatives because the client is always trying to put as many RTBs as they can into a 30 second commercial or a social video or whatever that is. And usually the response of the creatives like, oh, there's no room, you know? Uh, the truth is there is room. 
you know, like in a 30 second spot, you can put like 30 RTVs. But then the, the problem is like, who cares, right? <laughs> like, which is exactly what you're saying. Like, it's easy to put like, you know, to list RTVs in 30 seconds, but no one's going to care. No one's going to listen to it. So that's why like establishing that connection is, is so important. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who's a master at that was Jerry Graff, right? Like he, you know, who, he was able to establish a connection in, in a very funny, very clever way, very fast. And then from that point on, you know, he could basically say whatever, you know, like the client want him to say, yeah. uh, uh, I, which is super interesting. They should call it re RTC, the reason to care. Which uh, would reason, which yeah. would eliminate a lot of the reason the RTBs. <laughs> yeah, because that's a great one. You should you should trademark that. Trademark you RTC. It. You heard it here first. It's automatically trademarked. <laughs> Attorneys is pending. Uh, this is a perfect segue to talk about uh, Hulu and what you did with that brand to kind of. I mean, I don't even. I barely remember Hulu being on the map in terms of it was on the map in terms of a product, but I don't remember it being on the map in terms of advertising uh, before yeah. the, before you started working on it. So t talk to us about like the story of that campaign and how you used honesty to come to, to get to that, that great campaign. Yeah. Uh, first, I'm just gonna, yeah, I was going to say you're out, you're out of focus. Like, you know, it's the, you're out of focus is me being honest. Like if yeah. you're, if, <laughs> Thank you for that honesty. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, like, you know, Hulu, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting story, right? Because like Hulu existed for over a decade. And then when they launched that that brand um, many years ago was uh, this notion that you could watch yesterday's TV into this streaming platform that used to be free. And then, you know, we grew and people forgot about it. Like they, they had like a really cool ad with, um, I forgot his name, but, uh, is it Alec really Baldwin? famous? Alec, Alec Baldwin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was a cool ad. I was talking about how like watching TV will, you know, like damage your brain or something. And we're here to damage your brain, yeah. which it was like, it was a really cool ad. And then they, and then, and then they disappeared. Right. And, um, and then they changed their, their product dramatically. Uh, you know, they became basically a cable replacement. They added a bunch of features and stuff. And also they became a paid service. Um, so people didn't really know what Hulu is. I think that, it, you know, that's another challenge that I think it's underestimated in advertising. Like when a brand or service, they change so dramatically what they used to be to what they are. Uh, the challenge of you recoding people's heads, what's the new thing is, it's much harder if you were actually just a new brand. Because if you're a new brand, it's a blank slate, right? Like you yeah. can, you're new, you're a new product, you can be anything. But if people think you're something and now you're something else, now it's, now you have to basically go back and erase what you used to be in order to be the new, new thing, yeah. right? So it was kind of like the situation that, that we had with them. So uh, the first thing that we said was like, well, I think that first we need to say something that it's absolutely provocative just so people pay attention to what we have to say because people won't pay attention to what we have to say. And then we wrote this insight that is, that is very interesting that is better ruins everything. And, and, it's, and it has like a really cool ring to it. Better ruins everything because once you try something that is better, whatever that thing they used, that you used to have, all, all of a sudden it's crap, right? Like, yeah. you know, like, oh, you love, you love flying on a plane and then you fly first class. And now every time that you fly coach, you think it's the, a terrible thing, you know? Like, and, you know, the same thing with like, oh, you know, your entire life you lived in an apartment and then you move to a slightly bigger house with a walk-in closet. And now it's impossible for you to go back to a yeah. walk-in cl closet-less house yeah. because now you have that, right? And, and so it's a really interesting insight. 
So we said, okay, with this insight, we should just tell people to never get Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and, and people, and the second question would be like, why? Well, because once you, you know, we're about to ruin TV for you forever. Once you have this thing, you're just going to think that the TV they used to is crap. But, uh, but that was super interesting because obviously that was like the first um, campaign that we did for them. They had just high, they had just fired an agency after six months because the agency wasn't able to nail whatever that was. And then we came up with this idea, never get Hulu. Uh, that is like, we're talking about honesty. Uh, it's a little bit disingenuous, but it's obviously a joke. Yeah. But it, but it, but it, but it, but then it goes into something that actually make, an insight that makes sense that when you experience better, you 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 don't want to go back, right? Um, as so well as, so as that well was reverse psychology. <laughs> true, yeah. So so that was interesting. But I think that we peaked. Like I think that not we peaked, but we, I think that we found the footing for the brand really with with a sports campaign. And what happened is that the people at Hulu, they're really smart. So they quickly realized that the only thing that people care about live television is sports. Because, you know, like shows you can watch in whatever streaming, but like sports to this day, like that is the one thing that you want to watch live, right? Like you want to see the score of the game as it happens. And sports is something you watch. News too, but I guess news you don't watch on TV anymore. You're kind of like read it on your phone yeah. but sports like you know sports is the, the one thing that you know you need to watch it live so our client uh ryan uh crosby who's a brilliant guy too and when michael schneider another brilliant guy great human beings they uh they basically came to us um and and they said um uh, well another thing that is interesting this part of the business didn't belong to us, belonged to another agency, and they, they could not come up with something that was, you know, uh, appropriate. So, like, they came up to us and they say, like, look, sports is, you know, why people care about live TV. And, uh, but we need to, but it's really hard to break into sports culture if you're an outsider. Like, you know, if and it's true, like, you, you know, you work at White and you guys had, like, Powerade, you know, like, you and Nike and, you know, like sports culture is like a very hard to get in kind of club. Yeah. And, you know, like, so how do we do this? And gets worse. We already paid a lot of money to all these celebrity athletes, you know, like now we need to make this work. So he kind of basically had the idea for us because what was he, what was happening there, Jason? He came to us desperate. He was like, you know, I'm going to tell you how it, what it is, you know, like this is what's happening. And we already probably, he was the one who signed a check of this, you know, like big payments to like celebrity athletes. Like, what am I going to do? And the answer was, well, just tell the world that. <laughs> tell the world. <laughs> <laughs> tell the world that you pay them a lot of money you know, for them to promote Hulu. So that's exactly what we did. Like, so, you know, fast forward to uh, a video of Damon Lillard saying, why am I a sponsor post for Hulu? Because they paid me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's genius. And now an influencer campaign you can't call bullshit on. Why am I in a sponsor post for Hulu? Because they're paying me. A lot. Well, that was real, but let's back up. This is Hulu. Pretty much everyone in the US knew about it, but pretty much no one knew Hulu had live TV for sports. Sports! So Hulu threw a ton of cash at some NBA all-stars and said, create an influencer campaign that feels real and authentic. Huh? Influencers are just people trying to hide the fact they're getting paid to sell stuff. But not our influencers. They got paid and got straight to the point. Hulu has live sports. Hulu has live sports. Hulu has live sports. These guys were sick and tired of faking it for other brands, so we let them sell out however they wanted to. Take Damian Lillard. Everyone knows him for his tattoos. And heading into All-Star Weekend, he teased a new one. It's your boy, Dang Dollar. I'm about to get some new ink, and I'm going to be showing y'all for the first time at All-Star Weekend, so stay tuned. Ooh. The internet theories lit up. 
until Damien shared his contract with Hulu just as our TV spot dropped during the game. Hulu has live sports. Really? Yeah, it's in my contract. And then there's Joel Embiid, who famously nicknamed himself The Process. He told his 3.4 million followers it was now Hulu has live sports. Mr. Embiid, why'd you change your nickname? Money. And while sneakerheads everywhere were waiting for Giannis Antetokounmpo's first signature Nikes, he teased this and messed with sneaker culture by dropping his first signature slippers. Do you have to wear this out in public? No, 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 never. See, out in the world, you're Nike. But on the couch, your Hulu has live sports. Not to be outdone by Nike, Adidas dropped custom Hulu sellout Dame Fives. Then, even more all-stars sold out. We knew the campaign was taking off when fans started changing their handles. Social media blew up, and the press took note. And there you have it, a 100% bullshit-free influencer campaign. But don't take our word for it. Hulu should win an award for this. Get that. And, and you know what's so funny about that? That again, just like I was talking about in Portrait from Detroit, like now I can post rationalize and say that everything was intentional, but it wasn't. One thing that we had no idea is that in sports culture, more specific ho hoops culture, NBA, basketball, there is part of the culture is the ostentation, is to show that you're rich, that you're successful, that you yeah. have like a gold plated. Rolls Royce and you know that you have very rich like the abundance so when the when these athletes like wait what I'm gonna be fanning myself with a stack of money great <laughs> you know so so uh so it just kept on getting more and more absurd and then uh I think that every brand they they've been to that position where they want to use a celebrity and the celebrity is like uh, I don't know if you know this brand's right for me with Hulu. I mean, Hulu wasn't a brand right for any athlete. Hulu had no business in sports, but hey, look, you're giving the chance for the celebrity to say, I don't care about this brand. I'm just here because they pay me a lot of money. And by the way, look at all the money that they paid me. It's basically an ad to tell the world how cool they are yeah. instead of the brand, right? Um, and that was super powerful. And, and again, like fast for it was like three years of Hulu has live sports, you know, like I think that we took, I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I'm, I'm probably going to butcher, but I think we, we took from 21 to 29 million subscribers, like for a brand that was existed for like 11 years, you know, so like the growth that we brought into the brand and, and again, like I think pop from a pop culture standpoint, if, yeah. if you watch sports, you know Hulu has live sports. That thing went off the rails. It, it became bigger than we could ever imagine. And the, the, the interesting thing and the kind of brilliant thing about it is everyone already knew that about celebrity endorsements. Like when, when LeBron gets on and, and is on an ad for the tonal workout machine, Everyone knows, first of all, they're like, he probably doesn't use that machine because he has like a team of personal trainers. I know they just handed him a gi giant check. And so to just say that and to be the first brand that really just acknowledges that is, it's weird. It's weird to even, like I have, to, I'm not smart enough to figure out all the reasons why, all the many levels that works. But in on one level, it's like, showing respect to the viewer where you're like we res we we know that you know that we just paid all these athletes so we're not going to disrespect you by trying to act like we didn't pay all these athletes and try to act like they just happen to love our streaming service we're just going to tell you that yeah we paid them you know that <laughs> we did you already know we did and we're, because we're going to tell you you're going to like us way more for telling you the truth about it in a funny, creative, entertaining way. A hundred percent. It's so it's so funny too because like there is you know like out of like the the realm or of forbidden conversations, the compensation is always a tough one, right? Like you know like if you're like really close with someone and you hear oh yeah like you know John Smith went from agency A to agency B, if you're really close to that person you probably know that that happened because that person is making a lot of money, <laughs> you know, like, but, uh, but, uh, 
and, and, and I think I would say that that's probably what everyone's wondering. Like, I wonder how much money, you know, John Smith's making now that he is working for that agency. Right. So like to basically bust down the door of that conversation into a commercial, um, it, it was it was pretty, pretty funny. And and, and again, like there, there are other layers to it that that made made it more special. I, I think that the one thing that is that it is interesting is that whenever there is this like sponsorship deals, I think that there is a lot of cautiousness, cautiousness to not mix like the value of the athlete with the value of the brand. But in this case, it, it literally, at, I think at a certain point we even wrote like a social video that is just like, why should you get Hulu? I don't know, I don't use it, but they paid me a lot of money to be at this ad. <laughs> I, think that it, I think we even got to that and then we're like, well, it might be too much. We, we might not need to go that far. But basically by doing that, we could put anyone in our commercial because we were not paying them to pretend that they like that brand, you know, and, and, and that, and that was all honesty. That was all, yeah. you know, brilliant being transparent. Um, so, so we, I try always on this podcast to, to, to make this as practical and useful to creative so that they can actually go away and put it into, put it into use to make better work. So what are some of the ways that you like to do this? Cause this is, this is, uh, definitely, I think, a, a hallmark of Guto's work is to try to find like, what is the honest, provocative, interesting, authentic thing that we can say. And so are there, like, how do you get to that? How do you, get, are there questions you ask yourself or what, what is your approach to, to figuring out like, where is that? Where is the, cause there are, as you said at the beginning, there's things that are honest that you shouldn't say, but how do you, how do you get to something interesting that you can say that would, that would actually help the brand to say it? Like, I'm sure there's more than one way, but what are, what's generally some of your approaches to that? Yeah, well, I, I think that the first step, no matter what the gig is, you should go to your boss and tell them whether or not they, they gain weight. That's step one, number <laughs> one. Step number one, you start there. Um, but, but I think that the most important one is, and, that, and I know that a lot of creatives struggle with it. Like, have you been in a situation where you you're writing a beautiful ad or a really funny ad or a smart ad that even though the idea is cool, you're not convinced because if you are there in that situation, you're not convinced that the product delivers on what is, what is, if you're in that situation, you're probably, you're probably not there because I think that, you know, like the most powerful work without a doubt will come from a person who actually believes on what they're saying. <laughs> I think that that is like crucial, right? Like, and, and I, and I think that, you know, there are, I think the guardrails for that to happen, as you said, there are things that you, you just can't say it. Uh, and that there, there are other things that might not be as powerful. Um, I don't know if there is, um, you, you can tell that I'm dancing around because I don't have a precise answer to your question, Well, but, I, but I, go ahead, In, please interrupt me right now. I'm going to interrupt you. I think there's, there's many ways, there's not one way to get to, uh, an interesting, authentic and honest message for a brand. There's, there's different ways you can get to it. And hopefully you can partner with your, your strategist and, and they may or may not bring you anything in the brief that that you can use as leverage or that you can use as a jumping off point. But like, talk to them about that and and hash it out with the strategist and be like, hey, I want to say like, I need we need to get to something more authentic and more true. Like, what are what are some interesting things, even if they're maybe not the most flattering things? 
what can we say about this brand that might be interesting? Is there any interesting story or backstory to this brand, uh, whether it be flattering or not flattering? And try to get them because a lot of times they've done research and they've looked into the brand more than you have at that point. So take advantage of them. But also, I, I like to start out with just just write down everything you know that is true about this brand, the assignment, uh, the product, and just write it down. Just what is true? Positive, negative, everything. And don't worry about writing it down in an interesting way to begin with. Just like get it down on paper. Like what are, what are everything that's true? Okay, this brand is third in the category. That's like a, a fact. Okay, maybe there's something that you can talk about. Like the famous campaign, I think it was for Avis? The car. Car rental, yeah. Yeah, I think it was for Avis rental car. And their thing, they were number two, like pretty distantly behind, I think, Hertz. And that was their campaign. Like, we're number two, so we try harder. Their whole campaign was admitting that they were not number one. So, like, that's an example of just starting with the insight of, okay, this company is number two, or this company whatever it is, just write down the facts of everything. And with a particular focus on maybe the things that are not the things that a brand would talk about in advertising that maybe are not like the most flattering or they're not like the best. And just start there and see if that leads to an interesting thing that you can talk about. And then I would, another thing is just going I, I have this list of uh, 70 questions or something that uh, I call my mega machine questions that I give to people in my program, but just a bunch of provocative questions that spark ideas, but a lot of them are about getting to the truth. So one of them is like, what is the worst thing we could possibly say about this brand? <laughs> what, yes. what, uh, what could we say about this? What could I say about this brand, but I wouldn't be allowed to say it? Uh, what should I never say? What should I never admit? Like get to the things that you shouldn't say. And often, or sometimes you'll find like, okay, there actually is a way that I can talk about that thing. That's really interesting. We, we, uh, we stopped recording and then Guto and I just kept talking and we started on what I think is such an interesting conversation that I'm like, we should be recording this. So Todd, first start with the, with that, with the seven, seven thirty eight fifty five rule. So, so yeah, there is a, so the seven thirty eight fifty five rule is a, is a super interesting one because, and, and I think that there, Chris Voss that we're talking about, he even talks about this in a masterclass or something, but, but the rule is basically is, is science this guys it's science, it's science. Right? Not, don't question science. it it's science don't question it. it's it's hard science so this they this guy from you see la um i'm gonna cheat here and see his name because i forgot his name is albert merabian he was a professor a psychology professor of ucla he ran this study and he realized that seven 38, the 73855 rule. So 7% is what you say, 55% is how you say it. No, 7% is how you, what you say, 38% is how you say it, and 55% is your body language. That's mind blowing, <laughs> right? Like basically like you're there, blah, blah, blah. No one is actually paying attention on I mean, not no one's paying attention. Only 7% of what you're saying is actually relevant. The rest is the tone and your body language. And, 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 and Jason, like you, you did a, a, a really interesting remark. Why is that? Why I, I, is that? Because we're animals. We're, we're, exactly. we're animals. And the animal kingdom communicates, all, well, almost entirely through body language, scent, uh, and, and a little bit of sound. But a, and I, what I was saying is that language, words 
can communicate complex ideas and they can communicate subtle ideas and complex ideas, but it's actually a very bad technology. It's a technology that is extremely prone to misinterpretation and misunderstanding. Whereas a dog's communication through scent is 100% accurate. (laughs) Now they can't communicate as they can't communicate complex ideas necessarily, but they know with 100% accuracy if another dog is in heat, if another dog is sick, they know what another dog has eaten in the last 24 hours. There's, it's 100% accurate. But when we talk as humans, just the words, there is incredible misunderstanding, incredible misinterpretation. So this, this rule is really interesting and it kind of makes sense if you think about the fact that we're, we're part of the animal kingdom and the animal kingdom communicates mostly through things other than sound. But continue. Talk- here's, here's another thing that is funny to add to. And by the way, we're not just talking about this because it's two guys that don't know anything about science discussing science. We're talking about this, how this connect directly to selling ideas and, and you know, like, because if you think about it, here's one thing that dogs are really good at it, at show the other dog dominance or lack of, right? Like you put five dogs together, it probably takes like two seconds for them to figure out who's the dominant one. Yeah. They don't talk. They're not asking questions to, to each other. Like there's something that they do with their tail or the way that they, you know, circle the other dog or whatever it is that they know right away the the hierarchy, the dominance. And 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 once the dominance established, then then they have a a harmonic you know, coexistence. Yeah. And then they they can start to cooperate and get things done together. (laughs) Exactly. And and, 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 which, by the way, I think that like those dogs that pull, like those dogs, those dogs in Alaska, Antarctica, whatever it is that they pull, you know, like the Eskimos. Yeah. They, it's not a human that goes there and say like, Hey dog, you should be the dog that goes in front and you should be the dog that goes in the back. The dogs, they self-organize. How crazy is that? Yeah. That they wake up and they know exactly, you know, who's, who should be the lead, you know, like who should be in what position. Um, so, yeah. and, and it goes on to this, the communication is insane, right? This um, is, well, this is such, I mean, this should be such a wake up call to, to anyone trying to sell an idea because at least in our industry in advertising, we spend 99% of our time on the words, on the least effective part of of the sales pitch and of the deck. We just sweat and labor and craft, oh, we gotta change this word to this word. And we, we, figure out what we're going to say in the meeting, what words are going to come out of our, that's only 7%. We spend, in my experience, we spend almost no time on how are we going to say it? What, what is the tone that you're going to say? What is the level of enthusiasm that you're going to say it with? What are you going to do with your body? How are you going to move? Uh, what are you going to do with your hands? Are you doing something with your body that is, if you have the absolute perfect words and you do the wrong thing with your body language, that body language based on this scientific fact that we just talked about is going to completely overwhelm the, the dumb words that you spent hours worrying about. Like basically we need to spend way more time on how we're going to say it and how we're going to present and what our body language is going to be. And we just, we put all the time into the words. I, it's so true. And obviously like if you stretch to, to the extreme, you know, like, you know, if you're, if you're like presenting something, sticking your finger in your nose, I don't think it's going to, 
I didn't think it's gonna go well. So <laughs> you know, like no matter how smart the 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 words are, are coming out of your mouth. But but here's another thing too that it's interesting, Jason. That I, I don't I damn I don't remember who was telling me this, but I, I thought it was brilliant. I don't even think it was in advertising, but someone told me that uh, writing was is supposed to it's not supposed to be used to communicate in real time and and if you think about it like writing was created to leave knowledge to the others that would come like you know like the egyptian the egyptians or whoever was like the civilization they're like well you know through our hard life we discovered this thing let's write somewhere because those who come after they will have that jump start. Yeah. But I really, if they could tell them in real time, those words would be much better. Right. So, so if you apply that to what we do, I think that the worst presenter, no matter how brilliant of a writer he is, is the guy who goes there in front of a client and do do and reads the script because he's basically bringing down all the power all the remaining 93 percent of power that he has you know and 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 and, and bringing down to seven percent um and it's so interesting that even in speeches and, and and again like obviously like you know big important speeches people use that the prompter and and we know that but Still, we prefer those who fool us, those who look like they're not reading, yeah, or those who at least know how to improvise in a way that makes you think that they are just speaking from the heart. Yeah, you know, which is which is fascinating. So, do you? I mean, this is making me realize just talking about this that that. Uh, I read scripts too much. Like it's making me wonder, should I ever reference a script or should I just figure out how to present a script without even looking at it in a, in a storytelling way. And that's hard to, I don't think you can, you can do that completely because sometimes the dialogue is so critical to the comedy or to the story, like the specific dialogue that's written. But at the very least, there should be far less. I mean, one of the things that I, I find is that creatives put way too much stage direction in scripts and that yeah. nothing is going to kill the vibe of a presentation more than a bunch of like, and then the, and then the actor moves to the left of screen and they pick up a vase and blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. Camera pans to the side and then, Bro. Like nobody cares. The client does nope. not care. that. Those are notes for a director yes. that you aren't going to need because this script is not selling because you, <laughs> <laughs> because you talked too much about what the camera was doing. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Well, here's a, like what I try to do. Um, and it's an, this is something else that, that, you know, like I was going to talk about and I completely forgot. Uh, and, we at a certain point we even the the, the like I, I would even ask creatives after going to the deck a simple question are you bored or not because like if you if going if flipping through a deck you're getting bored that's a really bad sign no matter if everything that is on those lights are very important right like if you're bored it's not a good sign but, but when it comes to, to scripts, what I try to do is, you know, obviously like writing, it's really important to write so you can organize your thoughts and think about like the dialogue lines, what's better, what's not. But once you get to that point that you think it's good, you think it's good and you see the magic and do the nuances because you are listening your own voice reading that thing. And, and, and then when you present, even... Ideally, you should be able to present that from from the heart and not read technical lines, which I agree with you are completely vibe killer. 
And then after you read the scripts and the client already liked, then you leave a PDF with a script because they would read that script thinking not about this, the story, but they would think about how you presented, how the tone that you deliver those messages, yeah. how you moved your body and, and so on. Yeah. You know, like almost a leave behind. Another thing that that we that I, I usually do when I have like a funny script, I usually put in the presentation, I don't put the script up into the screen. I put just the visual of the script up into the screen and I tell them the script. Yeah. And then and then I flip to a slide where there is the script there so they can basically read it again. But at that point, they already know the tone of the script, the speed of the script, like what's going yeah. on, all the jokes and whatnot. That's an interesting know? way to, that's, I have not thought about that, but if you present it well and you do it in the form of a story and you do it with energy and enthusiasm and, and storytelling, when they read the leave behind script, that's what they're going to remember. They're not just going to... But if you present it like a robot and just read it off, then when they read the script later, they're going to probably have that same energy that it's the script is being presented like a robot. I mean, it makes me want to push this even from my presentation uh, skills further by now I can imagine the best way to do it is to if there are critical lines of dialogue that are written, you know, cause we, we take a lot of craft in writing the funniest way of saying a line or whatever. I'll have some way of, if I can't memorize it, I'll write that somewhere that I can, when I get to that point in the script, I can say the line properly, but the rest of it is all just from, from the heart, from memory. So I can just tell it like a story rather than like just read the whole thing but yeah you, you know another a classic example i don't even know if this is like you know i hope i don't think it is like uh wrong to say but one time i was i was working with a, with a really good writer and and he and we had a review and he sent me the script prior the review and i and i and i saw the script and i was like oh that's kind of funny I, I thought it was funny. It was like, that's kind of funny. But then when this guy came and presented the script, he presented the character of the script, the lines of the character of the script, he presented with a lisp. He, he talked as the character that he already had casted in his mind had a lisp. <laughs> and that made the entire thing way funnier. <laughs> and he didn't say, he didn't write in the script, like, well, you know, like, and then the little boy that walks in the store, he has a lisp, you know, has a list. He didn't say, he didn't write that anywhere. But when he presented, he presented as if the boy had a lisp. So every, so to me, after that, I was like reading that script and thinking about a boy with a lisp and thinking that is hilarious. That is super funny. And, and again, maybe if he wrote that on the script it wouldn't even make any sense yeah. you know it's all yeah. about you know what i'm saying um well i told you a joke the other day this one's pretty dark should, it, should we tell the joke of the guy in the hospital <laughs> too dark no you can we can always cut it out and tell it all right so so like that joke that i told you the other day which now i already gave away that it's a joke but like you know this this old man he this old man wakes up in the hospital and then the doctor comes like three doctors come to the room and the, the, the chief doctor says, Mr. Wilson, soon you'll be able to see your family. And Mr. Wilson goes, oh, I wish I'm the I'm the, the, the last remaining. My entire family already passed away. And the doctor goes, we know. <laughs> 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 so, so, you know, what, what would be if this was a script open on a hospital room, there are equipments beeping everywhere, the camera pans to a man laying on a bed, all of this, you know, it's already like, it's terrible, right? Yeah. Like, 
I'm it's already a, bored. It's it, it's a it's a game changer to to think about this seven thirty eight fifty five rule. To to think about the fact that the words are literally only seven percent. Sorry for cutting Guto and Jason off there. If you want to listen to the full two and a half hour version of this podcast, go to schoolofastonishingpursuits.com and check out Creative Mega Machine. If you get in, Jason Bagley himself will teach you the secrets and techniques to doing the best work of your life, getting better creative opportunities, making more money, and having more fun. We hope you enjoyed the first part of the episode, and we hope to see you in the second.